I believe it is my job as a content creator to share memes that I find with all of you, as long as I can make them instructive. So today, my friends, I present to you the pterodactyl defense of the modern, the beef eater variation. I'm not even gonna have a long intro. All I'm going to say is that I'm going to give you the theory, the moves are in the description as always, and at the end, three games as always against subscribers. So the beef eater variation is something with black that begins after d4, we play g6, setting up bishop g7, and this is good if you're gonna play the king's Indian, if you're gonna play the Dutch, so you have to fuse a few things together here. c4 by white, bishop g7, and knight c3. The beef eater can become a thing with these moves. First, we're gonna cover the beef eater, then we're gonna happen, you know, we're gonna look at if our opponent is a vegetarian, or a pescatarian, or a vegan, and doesn't wanna engage in beef eatery. So here we play the move c5, kind of activating the dark squared bishop here. Some of the uh, more classical fans uh, from the older days might remember this as the Jinji Indian defense, named after Roman Jinji Hachvili. And the point here is that if black, uh, sorry, if white pushes, we take on c3, and we then play the move f5. And now we have arrived at the pterodactyl defense of the modern beef eater variation. It's like, why, why? What? Why did we do any of that? Well, let me explain. We've traded off our dark squared bishop, which normally is supposed to be our beacon of hope on g7. However, we have damaged our opponent's structure, and this pawn locks the c4 and c3 pawns in a row. Those pawns can be targeted with the opening of this square for the queen, like this. Our knight comes to f6, and with our f-pawn, fights for control of the central square e4, and essentially what our setup looks like is, for example, knight f3, knight f6, d6, this cascade of pawns, right? And this leaves a bit of an opening on e6, but the knight getting there isn't that bad because we can just take, and now our opponent has the bishop pair, two bishops versus our one, but the position is super hard to navigate because it's not so clear how to break. And our plan is very simple. We will play queen a5, we will play knight to d7, and we will combine a, you know, some ideas of whether we're going to play down the middle, on the king side, or on the queen side. So down the middle basically means knight comes to e4, and we pressure like this. That's useful if this bishop is passive and hasn't come to d3. On the king side could mean we play h6, g5, expand on that side of the board as long as we haven't castled, and on the queen side can mean knight b6, knight a4, so something like this to hit this pawn, or something that I do in the practice games, trying to set up some sort of way to push the b pawn forward, which will destabilize the center like this uh, and open up the a and the b lines for our pieces. I love this system because of how tricky it is. I'm now going to show you the most critical response against the b feeder, and then we will look at everything else. The trickiest lines, in my opinion, uh, when you play this pawn to f5, which does admittedly look like it weaken your structure a little bit, first things first, if white just tries to hit at you immediately, and if you take, plays this move f3. This is considered the critical main line. How often will you face it? I can almost assure you never, but you have to know what to do. Hikaru recently played uh, this exact variation in a title Tuesday literally like a week ago or two weeks ago, and you just play e5 here. The point is that if white plays pawn takes here, you have this check. So you check and you win this pawn. And potentially more. And the best move after e5 is d takes e6 and the very cool knight c6. The point being that after pawn takes, bishop takes, okay, white still cannot take because of queen h4, and you're just gonna go queen e7 and castle this way. How terrible is white's position? It's the 10th move of the game, and white has not developed a single piece Come on, stop, stop it. The other critical variation is the move h4, which is a lot more natural looking than the move e4. That I can guarantee you, and against h4, you actually need not worry. Queen a5 is still perfectly reasonable. If here something like queen c2 happens, uh, you have knight f6. I mean, h5 looks a little bit scary, uh, but even taking it is like not, it's not so bad. Because this is hardly anything. Queen cannot come to f5 because queen is going to take on c3. So this is not something you always need to concern yourself with. 
uh, knight f6, d6, and all of these moves are gonna come in handy. It's a very easy opening to play, but now I have to say, what if it doesn't happen? First things first, what if we get here and the opponent doesn't play knight c3? Later, we will look at everything that can happen if e4 happens. I'll recommend everything I think is good for us after e4. If the opponent plays knight f3, I still very much like the move c5. The point is that uh, taking this pawn is just bad. And actually, before I even jump ahead to that, taking this pawn is, uh, is, is, is just not good. Now, you can just play bishop c3, bc3 and triple the pawns, but in reality, you also can just play knight a6. And it's really not easy for white to hang on to this pawn. If white plays some ridiculous looking move like this, now you can take to triple the structure. The queen comes to a5, the knight is coming to f6. Uh, there's no way white can hang on to everything. And my favorite move, which is knight h6, if the bishop goes to e3, to try to play knight f5 and just get rid of the bishop. So that variation is also quite nice. Taking on c5 is just a terrible move. And if you haven't watched my Learn Chess openings and how to study them video, uh, definitely make sure to do that. Moves like e3, so any e3 move, you can just trade. Knight f6, pawn comes to d5, you castle. Now actually you're in a, a, a weird Karakhan defense if this move happens. And this kind of gets me back to the move knight f3. If c5, d5, you know, you can play this like a king's Indian. So you can play like knight f6, castle, and so on. Or here you can actually play the move f5. Hoping for knight c3, and now voila, voila, we have returned to the bifiteur. I don't know why I went a French accent for that. I don't, I, I'm sorry, it's late. It's like 11.30 at night, all right, I'm tired. Anyway, you can go back to this with f5. Also, if they don't play into your bifiteur, like they play knight f3, you can play the Dutch. So you can combine the B feeder with another defense, like a King's Indian or a Dutch. Boom, now your whole repertoire is set. What do I mean by that? I mean that if on D4 you play G6, and now at any moment they play E4, okay. I mean, okay, Bishop G7, okay. And now you just play the King's Indian defense. And you could play different versions of the King's Indian defense too. You can play C6 and D5, or you can just play the King's Indian defense. But actually, one benefit of this way is you haven't played knight f6 yet. Why is this useful? You can play for a quick e5. So, I, you know, I try to include nuggets of information in every video that I make, even if I'm talking about something for 30 seconds so that you can learn. The difference with the traditional King's Indian defense is you haven't moved your knight, which means you can play knight d7 and you can play e5 quickly. And if they play d5, now you don't even need to go knight f6. You just go here. What's the point of a king's Indian defense? To play f5. So now you don't even have to waste a move on knight f6. You just go knight e7. You castle. You play h6 to prevent anything from getting in here. And then you play f5 and you're in business. Black has a fantastic position here. Unbelievably good position here. So... You can combine the b-feeder with the modern defense, delay knight f6 if they don't let you play the b-feeder, e5 is next, and then knight e7. And if they do play into a queen's pawn position, so something like c4, well, for example, just one more thing, what if they play the London? If they play the London, huh? The dreaded London. c5 is a very good idea anyway, because you have this laser beam. And if something like this, you can take knight f6, d5, or, 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 or the Dutch. There you go. The Dutch defense, f5. And now what you try to do is build up for a very quick e5. So you combine the King's Indian and the Dutch defense for f5, e5 in the center before you play your knights. It's just about monitoring how our opponent plays. Don't be worried about the London. You will 100% face it if you play g6. You will also face e4. Try to combine a few of these ideas with this early quick e5, f5. Uh, and I think you should be good to go. I've included all the moves in the description. Now we will play uh, three games versus subscribers from my Twitch channel. So the first person up who we will be playing is Jerry Bomb. Jerry Bomb is 1128 rapid chess, d4, g6. c4, bishop, g7 is the plan. Something like this. And we will see if he plays knight after. Okay, so he does play knight c3. Now we will go with our c5. See if he takes or pushes. 
Pushing, of course, would be more fun. That would be the point of the video. Um, okay, he does push. Fantastic. Time to chop. The beef eater variation. Coming up with F5. I am very excited to see what my opponent plays here. The theory is messy. The position is messy. It's really complicated, and we'll see how an 1100 who... Well, I did tell Jerry Bomb before the game that I was going to play the beef eater variation if we got here. So now we have a beef eater variation. Of course, bishop f4 is quite a natural move. Uh, queen a5 and knight f6 are both possible here. I'm going to develop pretty naturally here with the move knight to f6. Of course, there is nothing stopping you from going for this immediately, but bishop e5 is quite a strong move if you go for queen a5 right away. So my opponent plays e3. Uh, again, queen a5. There, is the, 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 there are ideas to kind of prevent me from just winning the game outright uh, in the beginning. I guess castling here should be completely fine. Getting my king out of the middle. Maybe knight to e4 right away was, was a move. And I've got, to, I've got to break out here in the center in a moment. Of course, as we discussed in the lessons uh, area of the actual theory of the position, we know that b6 and bishop a6 is also okay. Uh, e6, there could be this. So I think I'm looking at knight e4, and I'm looking at d6 right, a, like right now to kind of block his structure. I talked a little bit in the intro about this potential weak square with something like knight g5 and knight e6, but the thing is we just take and we have a very solid structure. We never really have to worry about our pawns being weak. It's very difficult for our opponent to get to the e7 square. In fact, it's just impossible. And we have ideas to play queen a5, knight e4, and as well as b5 even, bishop b7, finishing our development and uh, advancing the pawns on the queen side. So a lot of ideas to combine here, and the position is very, very much imbalanced. Uh, and the players kind of have to think on their own terms. The main reason I play these games in this section of the video, if you have made it this far, uh, is because the truth is that remembering the theory here won't necessarily serve you all that well. You will have to adapt to what your opponent does. Queen b3 is a move. Doesn't really do anything that scary. It confuses me a little bit. Uh, my opponent says, I love you, Dad. I think my opponent is mildly confused. Let's bring the queen out to a5, as advertised. The queen is very nice on that square. Of course, I would also like to accomplish the move knight to e4. In the preceding position, I could have also maybe played the move e6, but I didn't really like opening the d file. Like, the rook and the bishop will stare down at that pawn. So instead, I just pop my queen out to a5. And, uh... Okay, that's a move. It's not necessarily a great move, but it is a move. So now if I play knight e4 and my opponent takes here, I can just play rook e8. And this bishop's gotta, gotta go, gotta get out of here. I really like knight e4, it's the first thing that I'm drawn to. I also just like a move like knight d7, for example, uh, developing another piece, but I'm really drawn to the move knight to e4. It just, it just seems very strange that my opponent hasn't developed the bishop and castled yet. And he's, uh, my opponent's allowing me this, this pressure. Even with the capture here on e7, I'll play rook e8. My opponent cannot take the pawn because of the defensive capabilities of my knight in the center. The bishop has to go all the way back to where it came from. And it just feels like I'm improving the position. And my opponent is wasting a little bit of time here trying to sort of figure things out. Uh, that's a pre-move that cannot happen. Unless we're playing the self-capture variant, in which case it can happen. So, uh, but we'll see. Of course, my opponent can just play... Yeah, exactly. My opponent can just play rook c1. And now I have a big decision to make. Do I take the bishop? You know, my first instinct tells me no. <laughs> my first instinct tells me to just keep pushing on this side of the board. Like bishop d7, b5, something... Ah, oh. you know what? I'm 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 recording for YouTube, right? So let's uh, let's maybe try to make some content. But you know, it's actually not so easy. If I play Bishop D7, there is Queen takes here, which is not the nicest thing ever. I can go A6 and B5, but but why? But why? Just play the logical move. Take the Bishop, 
Again, we are not worried about this coming here. We can just take it and it's not going to be so, so easy for my opponent. So just a6 and b5 here is nice. Knight e6, bishop takes. Queen takes b7, actually, is a pretty cool idea. Uh, not taking back the bishop and trying to trap my rook in the corner. Uh, win my rook in the corner, rather. But I think my opponent will get their queen trapped if they play like that. I think there's like some way for me to lock this queen away uh, and just win the material. But we'll see. That's why we play the game. That is why we play the game. At the same time, when the knight comes here, I don't necessarily have to take it. I could just play something like rook f6, which would attack the knight with a second piece. And I'm trying to just go b5 so that I can open the a file here with my queen and rook and get in on the queen side. Very interesting position, honestly. Very interesting. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to include games like this at the end of these videos. For those of you who stick around past like the 10 minutes of theory, so you can see how to implement this stuff. So b5. b5 is advertised. I actually think my opponent's best move here is to completely disregard my queenside pawn. And potentially even go for some attack with h4, h5. Which would be very crazy. If my opponent did that. But as we studied in the introduction, that's a legitimate weapon, it's just... It's not always so strong. It sometimes looks a little bit stronger. Now I think is a good moment to ask this knight what it's doing. Uh, determine whether or not my opponent wants to take the plunge here. Or just be solid. Go back. Knight e6 will lead to some sort of chaos. I can probably take once. Take here. Knight c6. Knight e5. Yep, of course I was ready for this. And now the big moment of the game. What do I do here? Do I take on c4 and then play knight c6? I've really wanted to open this position. If I take on, if, let, let, me, let, me, let me go knight c6 without actually taking. The good thing is this queen's diagonal to my king is completely blocked. And this pawn is a liability for white, much more than it is a strength. So take, take, of course bishop takes looks good because it attacks the knight. And for a moment, my opponent will be winning. For a moment, my opponent. That rhymed. We'll be winning some material. I'll bring the knight to the middle now. And this is hanging. Of course, a4 is a move that I, I actually overlooked. I completely missed that my opponent can play a4 here. The pawn is out of danger. The bishop's out of danger. Oof. Okay. Luckily, my opponent also missed that, just allowing me to take. And if I can make this trade, then probably I'm doing well. I, I think I mishandled something there for sure. Uh, curious. I gotta, I gotta review after the game, uh, what, what it was, because I'm actually, I'm not so sure. So rook takes a2. But now we're doing quite okay. This pawn is nothing. That pawn's not going anywhere. We've got a more active knight. We can bring the king to f6, and in many end games, we're happier than our opponent. That is a fantastic move. That is an excellent move. My only move now is knight g4. At least it looks like a very good move because my knight is almost trapped. But e3 is hanging. So in many endgames, the opponent can end up with pawn weaknesses. Which is nice. Ah, my opponent blunders. Oh, it was an excellent move and now my opponent blunders immediately. And this is a very bad mistake because not just the rook is hanging, but this too with the knight and the, and the, and the rook. I might not even take with the rook with check. I might take with the knight and then try to win both of these pawns. See, you can take with check, but then you have to bring the rook back to defend. Which is why I think I'm just going to play knight takes pawn. And now we have a two pawn lead. One that could potentially balloon very quickly to a three, ultimately a four pawn advantage. Now this one, we didn't win out of the opening. Uh, we just got a complex fight. Of course, now, the easiest thing to do is to take and then take the pawn on f4. So we're up three pawns, and this is just winning. But we will review, and we will see what my opponent could have done better or worse. Better or worse, after all. This is the point of the video. Can take with check. I think I will do that. Picking up yet another pawn. Knight e6 is okay as well. Knight g5. Uh, and the one thing to be careful about when you win this pawn is this pin... On our king. Oh my, I can play here and win this pawn too. But I'm going to win this pawn. 
This is not super scary. Our rook can guard, and when this rook comes, our king can guard. But just be careful. It's never too late to blunder and do something dumb. Now everything is protected. And uh, we will... Uh, we will move on to win this game. My opponent decides to take, but we have a five-pawn advantage. Put my rook in the middle and push my pawns. I think the next few games uh, I will play. Uh, I'll play five minute and five second bonus. I feel like that's uh, maybe a little bit of a. Nah, you know what? Whatever. Y'all deserve it. Let's make it ten minute. My opponent resigns. It was a very interesting game, as I said. Uh. Bishop f4 is one of the moves, and here we, we played relatively normally, I would say. I, I don't think we did anything, anything out of the ordinary. We could maybe play d6 and a quick e5 a little bit faster. But, you know, after the queen came to b3, you know, maybe in this position, uh, a better plan would have been to uh, just stabilize the queen side, like with b6. And h6, g5, knight e4, and focus on the other side of the board. But it's tough. I mean, I played queen a5, knight e4, and then, and then we were in business very quickly here. Uh, I could have also considered uh, just playing b6 instead of playing for b5. The idea being that, like, if something like this were to happen, uh, some knight d7, knight e5, and pressure on the c4 pawn with rook b8 being the move that we plan in the future. But it's, it's hard to allow the knight to come to e6. You just have to be kind of ready for this to, uh, to happen and trade it off accordingly. Okay. Let's go, Steven. I don't know what Steven's going to play against me. But he does know that, uh, that, that, I'm, that I'm playing this defense to teach it to all of you. Let's go G6. Bishop G7. Okay. He's busting out all the same moves. Now, every subscriber who I play that watches my other opponents play... They, they, they know what I'm going to play. So bishop c3 and f5. Last person played bishop f4, so I hope, I hope Steven didn't watch that game and he goes, I'm also going to play bishop f4. It's better to have variety, Steven. Good, knight f3. Uh, again, this is not really a move you need to think about too much, knight to f6. Uh, it's going to happen basically always. Although you can play d6 and try to play for a faster e5 to try to close up the center. But of course, knight to f6 is completely normal. Now, bishop f4 is astoundingly normal. Like, it's just super normal. So, of course, you, you consider it as well. I think now, um, last game I put my queen on a5. I mean, I kind of want to do it again. I don't, I don't know why I wouldn't. You know what I mean? But let's go b6. Because it looks like he's trying to put his bishop on g2. And I will play bishop to a6. That is how I'll play this. I will punish his setup a little bit. Since now it's not so simple for him to defend his pawn on c4. If he tries to push through with d6, it's really not the scariest thing ever. I have knight c6 just blocking the diagonal. I also have e6 not allowing the pawn in. Uh, but this is kind of punishing the setup where now this bishop does not defend the pawn on c4. Of course my opponent does have a move like queen a4, which kind of negates the movement of my pieces. But knight d2 is a very nice move. Good move by my opponent here. I think I'm going to castle. Again, this is not scary. Let's see if my opponent bites here with d6. I'm just going to play knight c6, and my opponent has just fallen into my trap, leaving themselves with isolated pawns like this. Another common idea is the move e6, as I talked about in the intro. Take, and then knight c6, and that will leave people in a bit of a state of confusion, because they kind of didn't expect that. e5 also normal, with uh, on passant, but d6, knight d7 is kind of the, by, by far, the gold standard here. And then maybe later we play for e6. Uh, also b5, even now. This trade to open up my bishop. My opponent's position is kind of blocked in. The bishops are blocked in with the pawns. But now the big question becomes, can my opponent successfully play a move like e4? Which my opponent seems to be setting up. Right? Something like knight d7, finishing development. And again, now that's, that's just a big question. Am I going to get hit with this move or not? Or not? What are you going to do? I'm ready. If you don't play e4 now, I don't really understand the point of the last few moves. So Let us see. There it is. Of course, we can uh, take. 
Uh, in fact, why wouldn't we? Isn't the knight currently protecting the c4 pawn? Am I missing something? Isn't that just... Does my opponent want knight g5? I think they do. I think my opponent does, in fact, want that. So let me take off the knight, because in this case, it's very different than the last game. In the last game, we were going to take the knight when it got to e6. In this game, we are not taking any knight when it gets to e6. It is way too strong there. So bishop e4, bishop c4 is us winning a pawn. Rook e4... Well, it's just a free pawn for us, if I'm not mistaken. Rook e4, however... Probably I would have gone knight to e5 and then stockpiled right here. But knight f6 is also kind of appealing just to attack the rook. Uh, but uh, knight e5 looks very good. Knight e5 looks very good. My opponent's written me a message. Uh, my, my friends here, my subscribers know that they're going to end up in YouTube videos, so they write me messages in the middle of the game. Which I respect. I respect. It takes a lot of nerves, honestly. Uh, you know, the, before, if you're watching this far in the video... We're like 25, 30 minutes in now. If you're watching, uh, you should know that I basically just go into my Discord and I ask for volunteers. I'm like, hey, you know, I want to play this system. Uh, please let me know if you guys want to participate. You know, I need this rating range and people volunteer. Sometimes people volunteer multiple times. They want to play in a few videos. It's a good move. It's a very good move. Uh, it's an unpleasant situation here for me as I have this weakness. The bishop moves, the rook joins the party. I'm leaning toward knight f6. It seems, uh, it seems very natural to play a move like this just to block this bishop. The difference is that knight e5, I think there is f4 if I had put my knight on e5. And I, and I just don't like that my knight can get booted. Although now that I'm looking at it again, I could have dropped back here to attack the bishop. But the bishop could have gone back. So, there you go. This move blocks the queen's vision. If I take... Take... There is a way to pick off my bishop here with a tactic. There is. What if I just take here first? I, I, nothing is, you know, nothing here is like crazy appealing. So I'm going to just put the pressure on my opponent to find the best move here. After bishop f6, rook f6, my opponent has this nice idea. Bishop takes g6 and the queen comes and attacks my bishop. Although having said that, Having said that, wait a minute. I might have something beautiful in that position. Let's see if it happens. Right now, bishop g6 is also playable, actually. Because if I take, my opponent will do the exact same thing. In fact, there is a small difference. Ah, my opponent misses it. Oh, man. Yeah, now this is going to be losing because I just get out of the way. And I'm up two pawns. I have some weaknesses to deal with if this queen finds a magical ticket to the h6 square. But it really shouldn't happen. Oh man. Bishop g6 would have led to a very interesting game. But c4 is a little bit too slow. And finding that for my opponent would have, would, would have needed just a, a little bit of tactical understanding in the position. Now I'm going to bring my queen up to try to bring my queen over to those squares. To hunt down the enemy king. And at the same time... Bring my other rook to e8 from where it stands nice and pretty. And then slowly build up my pawns here. That's the only downside here of the structure. Position looks pretty good. Knight can also jump out once I get this defended. That's really the big thing here is the bishop and the rook are both staring down. So if I protect this pawn with my rook and my queen... Then I can play knight g4 and attack over there, as well as rotate. It's the thing about knights. They can go zigzag zig and jump into f3. Or any square, if they go zigzag zig. But particularly the f3 square. I'm going to drink a little bit of uh, grape juice here. Queen d7 is nice, and... Uh, it's not, it's not easy to play a position where you don't have pawns. Of course, what I mean by that is not that you're missing eight pawns. It just means you're missing central pawns. This bishop relinquishes control of this. And I think I'm going to jump in here to e4. Attacking both the queen and the bishop. Uh, and attacking the f2 square, which I believe is significantly more important. Because that would be a third extra pawn. 
At the same time, if queen e3 and I take, my e7 pawn is hanging. I do have knight to h3 there. But I think I would rather live in a world where I don't lose my e7 pawn, and I think I would just take the bishop. Really, the biggest imbalance in the position is these two pieces. My opponent has the dark squared bishop, which I do not have, and I have the knight, which my opponent doesn't have. If I isolate the two same colored bishops, the two light squared bishops in the endgame, if I isolate them on the board, then I will be two pawns up in an endgame where my opponent does not have substantial imbalance to create anything in the position. Whereas the difference with playing like a bishop versus knight endgame is that the bishop can avoid the knight in many circumstances. So now is the moment. I think I'm going to take the bishop on g5. My opponent does have this, but of course taking the knight is, uh, well, you just take the knight and you don't think twice about it. I think I will play rook f7 here with the intention of doubling up my rooks. Rook f7 also does the job of defending the e7 pawn. My rook on a8 hasn't gotten into the game yet, and I think now is the time. And uh, I'm very happy here. My position's looking good. Feeling good, looking good, eating good, playing good. Just does not, not, not much for white to do. I mean, bishop g2 even can, can trade the pieces, but okay, there it is. Here comes the double. I believe the double is going to happen. And when the double happens, I will push my pawn two squares and stand triumphant. My pawn will get out of danger. And my rooks will be staring down at f2. Very perplexed here by this long thought by my opponent. I, I thought rook e2 had something in mind when it was played, but uh, okay, no harm in thinking. Yeah, this I'm not even going to think about. I'll just trade immediately. Uh, and here, with this move, I'm setting a trap. It looks like I have lost a defender of this pawn. But let's not forget this rook is defending the king. So this rook cannot do both at the same time. The rook has to choose. Taking on e7 is bad. And if my opponent... Okay. So I have rook takes f2 here, which is a cool move. It doesn't necessarily win, but it looks very exotic. The point being that if rook takes rook, I have queen takes. My opponent should not take. My opponent should play the move. Well, my opponent should have just moved the king back. Because now we get an endgame, which is queen versus rook. And for instructional value, we will simplify it down into a winning king and pawn endgame. Because we have more pawns than our opponent. We have five pawns versus three. We have three on one pawn majority. We'll push these pawns. We'll trade and we will be victorious. King c3 and the pawn will promote. Just in these positions, you need to be careful about stalemate. But stalemate was luckily avoided. Let's review this game briefly before we play the next person. Knight f3. Uh, knight f6. G3. B6 I played. B6 could be a little bit too slow. Uh, this whole plan that I did with bishop a6 could be a little bit too slow. Uh, but knight d2 wasn't necessarily the best move. Uh, the best plan here after g3 can be to just play like d6, for example. Uh, castle, in many circumstances, h6. Uh, jumping the knight into e4 and then trying to play for e5. So, for example, bishop g2. Uh, rushing with e5 isn't really recommended because, in reality, you're just opening the bishop here. And that probably isn't the right thing to do. So, don't rush with e5. I think what we did was, was pretty okay. And this position in the middle game with our opponent pressuring us a little bit. You know, bishop uh, d3. The trick here was that if I took, take, take, and bishop takes g6, I think I have a very cool move here. Rather than taking back, I was going to play this, which is what I was calculating. Attacking the queen and the bishop. And if the queen comes out here with check, I have a very cool move, c4. Sacrificing the pawn allowing the move d5 to attack the queen, and the bishop is still under attack. A very cool tactical sequence there, uh, but we were able to outmaneuver and win the game. So, last match will be against Willow. Willow told me beforehand they were, they, they were not going to play knight c3. But let's see if that happens. Okay, there it is, knight f3. Now, of course, as I said in the intro, you are free to play d6 here and go for a king's Indian. 
I am still going to play the move c5. And we will see what happens. We will see what happens. If d5... Okay, bishop b3 is a... That's not something I covered in my intro. <laughs> uh, taking on c5 now is no longer a possibility, which makes me think I can play knight c6. Okay, let's play knight c6. I mean, d5, bishop takes b2, so... I don't think bishop e3 is a thing. I think you gotta go e3. Of course, white can just play a move like knight c3, and then we will get a position where we just trade, but the bishop on e3 is a bit clumsy. Ooh, I am questioning some of this. Let me take now, so the knight comes out to d4, and rather than trade everything, I'm just going to play knight f6. Although, knight e4, of course, which is my idea, can be stopped very easily with knight c3, Hey, who knows? Maybe we just get a normal game. Opponent does have to be careful. The very natural looking... No! <laughs> I was just about to say, the queen is overloaded. Oh, no. We just take. My opponent forgot that the queen is protecting the knight as well. That's the danger of trying to cheese so quickly. That's the danger. I was just going to say the best move there is just knight c3. Because now we just take this and we have this. Queen g7 is unfortunately not scary for white. Because we just go rook g8. And uh, the queen's got to go back. Queen's got no other move. Oh, right on cue. Oh, that's heartbreaking. That is heartbreaking. But it's fine. Because it shows you that these mistakes happen. And it shows you how black's pieces coordinate well. So I'm happy with the game regardless. Let me just go back and I'll castle on the next move. Now we will see where my opponent castles. Yes, I don't have a dark squared bishop protecting my king, but I'm also up material, so. It's an interesting idea, f3, wow, to play e4. I respect it. I like it a lot. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to play e5, and on e4, I'm going to drop my knight into the center of the board here. I anticipated that my opponent would set up this light squared structure, which means that there is a big hole in the center there on d4. And this is called an outpost for my knight. It can be challenged, of course, with a move like knight here, but I'm very happy to make that trade because I'm out material. Or there, same, same thing applies. And now I can put a second pawn in the center and solve all my problems. If you want to learn more about outposts, you should follow me on Instagram, at Gotham Chess. One third of my posts are just instructive chess content. So you get some on YouTube and you get some on, uh, on Instagram. Not everybody uses Instagram, but if you do... Now I go here, because if take, there was this. So now I've created a passed pawn. I will, of course, develop my bishop to the very natural square on e6. Nothing to think about here. And since the king is on this side and there are some pawns in the way, what we will do is slowly chip away at that side. We will play a6 on the next move, as well as queen b6. That also looks good. Rook to the middle, or a6, and rook will come alive here. Fantastic move. Excellent move. No joke. My opponent has to play fast here. So I'm going to play a6 because I also have to play fast. Now, I could have also played h5, but then g4 comes, and I don't have to take necessarily. Eh, there's g4 anyway. But the thing is that I think I'm a little faster. I think that I'm already attacking something near my opponent's king. My opponent is still trying to get a full attack set up here. So we'll see comes bishop takes a2 now of course you don't go here but frankly nothing is that great because now i play rook c8 and the king has no escape the queen has to block the king should have ran more actively like this but even then it's very unpleasant so i was able to create this attack on the queen side by just pawn breaking uh against my opponent queen a5 now rook is coming to c8 and the conversion process here is that we will swarm the king. I don't even think we need to go to the endgame. And what I was going to say is I created an attack on my opponent's queen side by offering a pawn trade, which would have opened my rook. We're learning a lot of things here. Rook c8, and I think this king is slowly out of moves, is what's happening. The king is slowly out of moves. I'm going to take... And... Okay, I'll be a little bit fancy and sacrifice my rook. Not necessary, but we walk the king to its death over on f1. We win this pawn. We get the knight coming to g4 or e4. 
That is a free rook, but I think I have force mate if I don't take the rook. Bring my bishop back as well. The king has no legal moves. And uh, check. King f1 or queen g3. Queen g3. If king e2, bishop c4 is checkmate in a few moves. Also, the rook is hanging. It all falls apart here. Nice game, this one. The, the, this one, this one was, uh, was smooth sailing. Let's bring the bishop back with a check. And we will just find the cleanest way to, to win the game. I wonder if I'm missing a checkmate here. No, I'm not, because queen f1 is mate. Queen takes d3, king e1, and queen 2 f1 is mate in one. And uh, we will say gg, although my opponent may not agree with me. It's a little bit better on knight f3 to play uh, e3, but as I discussed in the uh, in the opening video, the theory part, I mean, even take take and like d5 here or knight f6 and d5 is perfectly okay for black. So you don't get your tricky stuff, but uh, you get a position which is very simple to play and is not critical for black, uh, whereas some of the other variations of the beef eater could be critical. And so we conclude our study of the uh, pterodactyl defense, the modern defense, uh, and specifically the beef eater variation. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you play any games with this, I'd love to see a game link. I'd really like to read through the comments and check those out when you guys play them. Uh, and that's it. I'll see you in the next video.